Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Welcome to Pod Mavericks Presents After Dark. It's an off-season edition. We're recording and going live uh, on YouTube. It is June 27th. It's Tuesday night. It's about 9 o'clock. This is Kirk Henderson and Josh Bow. Josh, how you doing? I'm doing good. We are off to a better start than the podcast I hosted uh, after the draft because I don't know if you listened, but we recorded about 15 minutes and I didn't hit the start record button. Start that will, button. And it, that, that, that button up there is a bit yeah. tricky because you you kind of got to click it twice. Yes, and I clicked it, and I thought I was like, I swear I clicked it, but yeah, it's great. I was reading all the reading all the comments from that one today, um, where I think one of the things that gets lost on people who watch it later is live reaction shows are very difficult because you're working with incomplete information. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's the first time I've been off grid for a Mavericks transactional period in 10 years. And I wasn't off grid, but I wasn't doing anything. And you weren't you know? in the country. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't in the country. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny. That night we were celebrating a friend's birthday and I was kind of looking at my phone at the table. And then I was like explaining to a couple of the guys there like what I thought was happening. It was, it was an interesting process, but it was it was a you know a shockingly really productive draft night. Um, mm-hmm. I think in the in the days since you know we didn't know this at the time. Tim Cato said on his show either later that night or the next day, seventy seven minutes in heaven, that the, the decisions made were very much made by Nico Harrison, Michael Finley, and the front office team. With I think Mark Cuban taking a more hands-off role than he might have had in some of this stuff in recent years um granted it's not like they've had that many draft picks even to make <laughs> in the last 10 years because the mavericks have not necessarily right. valued well, where does draft. that come from you know right. where did that comes down from the top right but i'll tell you you know it, it's it's an, it was an interesting thing to go through real time where uh i've not when they selected when they traded back and moved off of bertan's uh contract that was really something that was when i was like okay this is this is special because oklahoma the thunder have have been one of two teams that have inadvertently sort of devalued the draft to a degree because they have so many draft picks that they can't you know it's like taking on a guy like bertons is not necessarily a big deal to them because they don't they're not paying mega contracts yet outside of Shea Gillies Alexander. So I really thought it was something that the Mavericks were able to move back two picks and then still select the guy that they wanted. As I understand it, uh, they were concerned about the Pelicans picking uh, um, Lively, Derek Lively at 14, which is why they did not trade back any further. Um, so that pick in and of itself was an interesting one for me. You know, I, I had talked with Rafael Barlow um, 
and he had been very high on lively when he came on our show here Mm -hmm. and at the same time though it's very it's it's an immediate tough sell because he did not play a ton uh, he played, you know, he was, he was uh, on on one of the ACC uh, defensive teams despite limited minutes. There's a lot of promise, but a team that's helmed by Luka Doncic doesn't necessarily have time for promise. And that's where we're going to have some fun, I think, talking about these guys. But along with, you know, sending off Bertans, they also developed this incredible trade exception, which a few, you know, something that they were clearly working on for weeks. This mm-hmm. is the part that's like the real chef's kiss. Yeah, the, because, the second move is what made the draft. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I'm not honestly said this guy's name out loud, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to have, have you say. I don't know. You say uh, it for me. I'm gonna I think it's Olivier, it. Olivier Maxence Prosper. I okay, probably missed that up. Lovingly called Omax, which makes yes. me think of Baymax from Big Hero Six, but that's a, a different <laughs> thing. And so. Then they also uh, they they took, got that pick from the Kings. Shout out to the Kings! Two drafts in a row that they send us a pick when we develop we get a player that Mavericks fans are instantly very into. Along with the uh, the two years remaining on Rashawn Holmes's deal. Um, now we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but the Mavericks still haven't announced Rashawn Holmes is on the team. So at the night of, it was pretty neat because we we had a. Um, Joe Holbert, uh, who's an NBA writer, he wrote for us two years ago, and I, I cannot find the article, and neither can Joe, but he had this this really good theory about how Luka Doncic and Rashawn Holmes might pair together really well because of the way Rashawn Holmes takes this fifth, like 14 to 17 foot push shot, which looks like an old man YMCA shot. It just doesn't look like an NBA player shot, and he's really good at it. And like yeah. with him and Luka in the short roll, like could be really, really fun. So it's like I walk away from that with, you know, uh, not really knowing much about Omax outside of the fact that I knew the Celtics wanted him and that completely ruined their night as evidenced by the fact that <laughs> traded back three times. So it's like I'm sitting there in Mexico positively thrilled by the end of the evening. So so what were – let's kind of walk through your you and Jordan's, uh, you know, reactions now that you've had some time to reflect. Yeah, it was very interesting, you know, doing it live because we kind of got the range of emotions. Um, Because when we found out that, uh, I mean, we we recorded after this all happened, at least at least after Lively was taken. But of course, you know, realizing that one of Taylor Hendricks or uh, Cam Whitmore, the forward from Villanova, was going to be available at ten, it was like, okay, they're getting one of the consensus top nine, uh, Bilal Kulabali. jumped into the top nine we mean you have said repeatedly oh, this is one it, it never it never goes chalk like it's never it's mm-hmm. never the nine guys that everyone mocks like someone sneaks in there or 10 you know whatever range you want to take someone always yep. sneaks in once you get outside of like top five uh range or top three range really um so you know just kind of processing that um once whitmore continued to fall the the sting of not selecting him uh, at least for me dissipated because i mean I'm going to be honest. I'm not a college guy. I don't watch draft. You know, we have guys on the site that that's, yeah, that's what they like to do. Uh, mm-hmm. You could not tell me who Cam Whitmore was six months ago. So I am not going to act shocked or appalled that the Mavericks did not draft this guy. when Certainly not teams. the night of. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting. Um, and then what makes doing a live show hard is you talked about like being prepared. I talked to Logan Thompson right with the, before the draft, I think on Tuesday, and one of the topics we covered, I was like, all right, tell me about the wings in the 20s, the mm-hmm. 20 to 30 range, because they're probably going to trade down. They didn't trade down. They traded back in. And I think he mentioned him briefly, but we went on, we talked about a bunch of other guys. So, of course, the Mavericks drafted, like, the one guy I just did not know in that range. So, mm-hmm. I basically was like, Jordan, just tell me, like, I don't know who he is. I just don't. I don't. I, all I know is that, like, he's been rising up boards, like, all the draft, smart draft people we know really liked him the last like two or three weeks, I think of the process. Mm-hmm. So um, the main thing for me is since I don't know these guys well enough to offer a concrete opinion past whatever their, their player archetype projects to be is more just like the process. And you wrote about it. I wrote about it. Yep. Talked about it on the podcast. They took the draft seriously, whether you like the players they picked or not, they did the thing we've been talking about. Not. It's use, just like use the draft. A, there's an element of 2020 here as well because in 2020 while we didn't love the green pick 
We loved the picks at 30, was it 31 and 30? And they, they traded and Josh, and they traded the, Seth. The pick. Yeah. Yeah. So they had three picks in the 2020 draft. It just turns out <laughs> historically, the 2020 draft is one of the biggest crapshoots on the planet. Like mm-hmm. Josh Green was actually drafted relatively close to where he might go in a redraft. I think he'd probably go in like the 12 to 15 range instead of 18 where the Mavericks selected him. But, you know, we liked that process then because it was like we kept, talked about bites at the apple, bites at the mm-hmm. apple. And this one, this was this was something. I, I We're going to get into elements of, you know, obviously there's like the eight and non-trade that we could that we're going to talk about and sort of some team building stuff as we head into free agency but the process felt good and i even think all right we'll look at elements of this in a year and maybe we'll say gosh i really wish they would have taken cam whitmore but the night of the draft you go with what you know and in the day since for example it's kind of slowly started to leak out that the villanova coach sandbagged cam whitmore in like mm-hmm. a way that's probably going to hurt the villanova program because stuff like that gets back to recruits and doesn't it just doesn't pay that's yeah, not good business <laughs> uh the medicals that don't really know like even whitmore seems mystified at that he played through some injuries there but he wasn't like a fiery leader as i understand it i also think yeah. he had kind of some pretty rough interview stuff and that stuff really can affect teams when you're really slicing a dice but like whitmore was like a top six, six guy and for him to fall to 20 is what it is. But the night of, I couldn't be mad at the Mavericks not taking him because you have to make the assumption they're working with the best information they have. Picking lively at 12 and what that means about the team moving forward, I think is really, really fascinating. Whether you consider the eight and trade or not. Um, my friend Josh McSwain is in the chat. He basically dropped into every one of these for the better part of three weeks. And he's like, <laughs> no Derek Lively, no Derek Lively, no Derek Lively. Not because he didn't like Derek Lively. It's just because you're operating on less than complete information. You know, five points, five rebounds, 20 minutes a game. You you extrapolate over 40 minutes. He has some pretty incredible statistics. His, his per minute uh, data is outrageous. It's outrageous. And that's what you have to go with. And then mm. there's also his per minute data on fouling. Yes, he is going to be it. he is going to be like um uh Jaron Jackson Jr. Yes. on the fouling front. Who, and that's who okay. still has a fouling problem. He still has yeah. a fouling problem and was yeah. also was he wasn't he def- defensive yes. player of the year? Yes. Yeah, so you're, or at okay, least he you, finished top two. I can't. I think right, he did lose. Fuck yeah. it. Like you, you live with <laughs> fouls. Like you can teach around fouls. You have to. You know, aggressiveness is is, and this is something that I think is is underrated at times. Particularly, when you consider a guy like DeAndre Ayton. You simply cannot cannot teach aggressiveness. So I I am settling myself in on the pick um, for him specifically. Omax want to circle back to, but lively. I am just. I am pretty convinced as of this moment right now that the Mavericks need to throw him into the fire and let him figure it out. The best way to get better at basketball is to play basketball. He's probably going to foul out. If you play him 24 minutes a game and he gets eight Will he reach points. 24 minutes a game if he... Right, right, right. So it's just like, <laughs> like, what if it's like, you know, one of the things everybody loved about JaVale McGee, and this is how I knew nobody watched JaVale McGee, is JaVale McGee's box score stuff, his basketball reference page, you're like, oh, my God. Well, if we could just get this guy to play 16 minutes instead of 12, he's going to get us rebounds and blocks, and he's going to score easy points. He's a steal. The only problem is he so negatively impacts a basketball game that you don't want him out there on the floor accumulating those stats. But with a guy like Lively, we're like, like he, he impacted winning. He impacted winning. And I'm, I'm really, I just, I want to see him play and, you know, whether or not he starts, whether or not he, he comes off behind a veteran big man. I, it's just, you got, you do not tank in the Luka Doncic era draft players and then bring them along slowly. Dallas has no choice. They have no choice. Um, Can I I offer you a devil's advocate position? Not necessarily that I disagree, but I just want to bounce this off you and see what you see how you react. Mm -hmm. That all makes sense to me. Last season, Jaden Hardy brought along slowly, went to the G League. Turned out he progressed very nicely. Why, you know, if that worked for Hardy, 
can that work for Lively? If you disagree, why? I'm just curious. Not necessarily that I believe that, but I'm just curious because they did bring Hardy along pretty slowly I last love, year. When, the way they when there was away. a demand, there was a demand for Hardy to play a bunch in November and December. So I'm just curious what you think about that. I think the kind of things that Hardy was bad at, he needed to go against inferior competition and work his way through that and up. Um, that's that's kind of my first thought to where Hardy coming into the draft last year fell like a rock because in the G League, he couldn't finish. He couldn't yeah, drive. He, he kind of recklessly <laughs> drove into the paint. And it was it was one of these things where they also had enough guard and wing depth to be able to bring him along. Granted, they could have used one more ball handler, as we talked about. But I think the way they brought him along was nice. Now, if what I'm saying is too radical, which is very funny if you know me, um, <laughs> I at least want to see an elevated timetable where instead of dividing the series into four – like. Have a plan by game 40 where you're playing him significant minutes. I understand what I'm asking for probably isn't going to happen because you don't want to break a guy's confidence. The NBA is serious business. I just, I really think that the only way for him to figure it out is to play through some of this stuff. And the difference between a rookie point slash guard slash whatever you want to call Hardy versus a, ro a rookie big man is a rookie big man's defensive um, I don't know, requirements, job, whatever you want to talk about is significantly harder. The Mavericks had, a, had have had saloon doors in the paint. So they have to figure out something immediate. Like he just has to go in and play. And there's also so. the, the case of, we talk about his offense doesn't matter because he's here for defense and they've had enough offense already. Like it's okay that he's not a a guy that can generate his own offense, but also if you still want him to contribute on that end of the floor, whether it's through rim running, cutting uh, offensive putbacks, you probably want, um, you want him to play with Luca as much as possible because you want Luca to set him up. Yep. You know, I mean, if he's the coming, offense, I'm not worried about. Yeah. yeah, this yeah. Is all but if he's, com defense. if he's coming off the bench, when Luca is on, on the bench, like if he's coming into the game and Luca's not on the floor, and there's no one to, you know, if maybe Kyrie's on the floor. Like, you know, that might be tough for him to not, you know, maybe clog up spacing, things like that. With at least when Luke is on the floor, um, the pressure is totally off him on offense. I mean, it should be anyway. I'm just saying, um, it, I think that it just makes more sense to to match his minutes with Luke as much as possible just to get him easy buckets. And Kirk, we, you know, I was a big man in high school. I think technically you were too in terms of like we were garbage men and when we played high school. It's a lot easier to do the garbage work when you get get the ball occasionally. Yep. Um so I think I think him playing with Luca, getting some really easy lobs can help his confidence and that might help him. I mean, I know this sounds weird, but it might help him on the defensive end uh just to feel into the game sure. uh, as opposed to maybe coming off the bench and he's like ignored because Luca's off the well, in the in the days since the draft, and really the days leading up to the draft, because I think he had a pretty good idea the Mavericks were going to try to take him. Um, he said a lot of the right things. He said a lot of the yes. right things since, and I I'm just it's it's nice because and I I mean no shots. Well, this is a shot, but it's just like after McGee and after Christian Wood, I'm not interested in big men that have that they're that are more concerned about their fifis um, like, sorry you play hey, with generational big man or you play with generational guards like okay. <laughs> uh go back even further uh willie Cauley stein samuel yeah. d'alembert chris yeah. kamen these guys that wanted numbers and mm -hmm. wanted to get the ball thrown to them in the post it's been a it's been a struggle i don't know if i've ever seen a top 12 pick the night of being drafted, being like, I'm excited to set to like to learn to like to set screens. Well, that's learn. the bitch like, of that's, it for me you know. when I go look at some of this stuff. And a lot of Duke fans have sort of corrected me on this. Like they've basically told me that Duke does so much motion offense, you're not seeing a lot of screen and roll. The one thing I firmly believe is that screen setting is something that can be learned. Mm -hmm. It is a tandem process, not just on the big, it is also with the guard. Like I have real beef when Luka Doncic doesn't use screens. But in and puts his guys in tough situations because he wants the mismatch versus like the actual process of a screen and a roll. But if he's willing to do these things, Luca's going to make him a lot of money. He's going to be very on the offensive end. I just I'm not concerned because a lot of this stuff is pure energy and effort. And 
You know, we all mock Dwight Powell for time to time, but the reason Dwight Powell worked for years and years is the same reason Tyson Chandler worked for years and years, or not years and years, for the 2010-2011 season. Tyson Chandler rolled hard every stinking time. Every time. And it cannot be understated how important that is to an offense. The threat, the lob threat, the roll threat, of which Dwight Powell is very good at, matters. It's why Willie Cauley-Stein could not cook it, because he wanted to be fancy and do all the shit that he did in his mixtapes. It's why Pizza Hands, Sam Dowell, and Barrett never worked out, because he just didn't have the physical capacity to do it. I, I'm hopeful that the on the offensive end, this stuff comes out in the wash. It's the defensive end where he has he's going to have a have to take a real crash course. We're going to see a lot of fouls. We're going to see a lot of bad plays. But you have to fit like you have to work through it. You can't do the thing that Rick Carlisle did to Josh Green, which was one mistake and you're done. It it just right. can't happen. No. no, that's not the way. And we've already no. seen with Green, uh, he seems to play better when he plays more. Yeah. Um, you know, so oh, he looked like saw that this last by the end of the year. He was like, yeah, hey, yeah. a lot this he, year. <laughs> he hit the, yeah, he hit the rookie wall in year three, which was kind of funny. Um, <sighs> but yeah, I mean, well, I think that's uh that allows for kind of a soft transition. Omax, who I know yes. even less about, and I have not sullied my opinion on looking at tape, but the data and the athletic measurables, he is a basketball athlete. Probably one of the top five, if you include like Amen and Osar Thompson, in terms of basketball athletes. Now, you, you're you probably going to wonder what I mean by that. And what I'm saying is like the athleticism he possesses translates directly to assisting his play on the basketball floor. He's not doing it. I'm not talking like a 48 inch vertical for the sake of having a 48 inch vertical. The kind of quickness, the arm length. I mean, the data on him when he sticks with his man. Like he's like a face guard guy, like a true mm-hmm. get, the guy who's gonna be he's gonna be guarding. You know, we like to call Dorian a lockdown defender. Dorian is a was a chaotic, excellent help defender that often got pinned as the stopper because he had to be. I don't think it was his best fit. That's why when him and Bullock really worked in tandem. So I'm really looking forward to see what Omax can do on defense. And anything else past that is gonna be a bonus. Yeah, he's kind of like um it's like a Dorian. <laughs> This is gonna probably be t- like I don't I, I don't even almost don't even want to say it, but he feels like a Dorian with more talent, um, which is not a knock necessarily against Dorian. He Dorian worked hard to get to where he was. You know, this Prosper is already you know double digit per game scorer in college. His three pointer is, is coming along, but in terms of just like his athleticism, it's he's got a seven one wingspan. It's pretty crazy. And like you said, Logan, when I did our pre draft talk, uh, I think when he did mention Prosper, he was like they had him. Base guard and chase Jordan Hawkins, the Connecticut guard who also went in the first round 14 to new Orleans. Who's like an off ball, you know, off screen shooter. They like, they, they had, they put him on him and had him run him through screens and stuff. And like, that's normally not what you ask six, eight, seven, one guys to do. Like you don't usually want them running through screens and things like that because their frame just isn't really, you know, built for that kind of stuff. Uh, but he did it, and he did it really well. You look at the games uh, Marquette played against UConn. I don't think Jordan Hawkins had great games in those games, and that you can attribute a lot of that to to Prosper. Um, he's, I love this pick. He's like the perfect type of pick for for getting back into the first round. You look at some of the wings that were taken around him, and he seems like the most NBA ready to contribute in terms of, you know, his defense should be like a day one. Like it's not going to be fantastic because not rookies usually aren't great defenders, but you can get him on the floor. I actually think he'll probably play more minutes next season than, than lively. will. um, I think so too. And I don't think that's crazy, but uh, he, yeah, I'm a believer. It's exactly what they needed. It makes the draft make so much more sense, you know, instead of just coming out with lively. Um, I don't know what else to say. Like, again, I don't know his game super well, but I just know, his athleticism is off the charts. Um, the flag is he only had like 12 blocks in his college career, yeah. which is really crazy. And, you, you know, you, you, that, you, like, you luck into blocks. Yeah. Usually, like, we've talked to smart draft people. That's like one of the things they look at first with these like big athlete guys is like, okay, what's their steals? What's their block rate? Um, and if it's low, like that's a red flag. And it was low for him. But you can make the case 
it was a little low because they had him at the point of attack so sure. much. She wasn't necessarily. If you're, if you're face guarding someone, yes. you're not coming off to get right. weak side help blocks ever. Yeah. And let's be real. If his blocks numbers were awesome, he's probably like a 15. Like he's not available at 24. Like yep. there's always a, 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 there's always something that makes a guy available later in the first round. Cause when you watch, like when I watch, I mean, of course it's YouTube highlights. So it's, it's biased, but every time I've watched him, I'm just like, how is he available at 24? Like he's exactly. What every NBA team some of the picks that happen in 20 to 40 blow my mind. Like while while I'm just thinking this out loud, that the Lakers got Maxwell Lewis at 40, I could have died because (laughs) it's just like that was who that was another guy who I hope the Mavericks were interested in. They they worked him out. Um, and I think had maybe Omax gone differently, they they might have taken Lewis that early. And that's just you know, that's just the way this stuff goes sometimes. Right. So okay, guys. Well, we're we're gonna we're gonna take a short break for our podcast or for the recording. But if you could do me a favor and go ahead and hit the subscribe button, hit the subscribe button to the Pod Pod Mavericks YouTube channel. That sort of stuff helps us over time. Um, a, you know, it, it doing the work in the off season will eventually make this show. And as Josh and I figure out how we're doing this. Uh, we'll make it better in the the regular season uh, as well. If you could also do me a favor and hit the like button for this particular stream, that would be great. I would really appreciate that. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. One of the things I love about Indeed is it makes hiring all in one place so easy and streamlined so I can spend more time on the rest of my business. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, now I think it's kind of, you know, we could probably continue to talk about the draft itself for another half hour, but we had an odd morning where <laughs> friend of the show, Mark Stein, dropped a truly fascinating report that the Dallas Mavericks last week, pre-draft, uh, and, and I'm not really sure when the, the, the talk sort of broke off, but the Mavericks made a play for... Uh, former 2018 number one overall pick DeAndre Ayton, uh, they offered, and this is the part that just floored me, Tim Hardaway Jr., uh, Rashawn Holmes, uh, and uh, JaVale McGee. And according to his story, um, the, the, the Suns got hung up on JaVale McGee, which before we talk about this more than anything else, we all get hung up on JaVale McGee. <laughs> like, like we, we should, the Mavericks shouldn't assign JaVale McGee. So the fact that he's the hang point for the, for a potential like super blockbuster, I know a lot of people are up and down on Aiton. I don't care. Former number one overall pick. Like that's a fucking fascinating thing. Yeah, and that is, that's to get, really. to get like for the guy that we all didn't like after two games to be, it's the, the guy who has a three year deal. He has his member guys. He has a player option for his third deal. Oh, what that was bar none, the worst offseason signing for any team. So congratulations for that last year. Now, let's work our way through our feelings with this proposed eight and deal. Now, the thing yeah. that, that before I before I give you a second, sorry, was that Stein was kind of unclear as to whether he thinks the deal is on like they've said no, but it's not a no to the deal. It's a no to that specific three person for one guy trade. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means it's still alive. And 
I, I don't really know how to talk about this because, and what's so please guys, particularly y'all listen to this live, like give us a little bit of grace in that we might say some things that are like incorrect because we're sort of really, I'm still working through my feelings on this. I just, I don't know whether I like would want the Mavericks to do it or not. Yeah. And uh, what I'm curious about is the timing of these talks, because if the Mavericks were offering homes, that means they had already done the deal uh, and drafted lively theoretically, you know, you, th- you know, because there wasn't like, that much, there wasn't that much time between them making that trade, getting, uh, well, wait, no, sorry. Apologies. They had already had, they already drafted lively by the time they got homes because they trade, they got homes to get the 24th pick. They must have known they so were getting home at lively. some point in the week before the draft. Like, Maybe. Yeah. That's because I'm like, did they, when they were making these negotiations with the Suns and they offered this trade, did they already know that they were going to have, that they have lively on their roster? Because I think that changes how I think about how they're negotiating about it. Because if they don't think, if they don't know they're taking lively when they make that offer, um, which still seems weird because Holmes isn't on the Mavs until they took lively. So, like you said, maybe they just assume they, had that deal, they just knew that they so were going to get They're going to trade for pick 24. Yeah. They're going to select a player, yeah. and then they're going to, you know, it's like, Flip it's it. probably yeah. like a, a complicated if then statement. Like they yeah. knew they were going to trade back and select somebody, then they knew, and they yeah. knew they'd create a trade exception. Like that, right. it's really complicated. I mean, and, and <laughs> this just, is. like hats off to the Mavericks because we often kick the shit out of them for the past several years for being very linear and they're thinking this was not linear this was like a tiered approach where there was a lot of like if this happens then we do this kind of things involved it's it's very fascinating yeah. and I, and I think the thing that's causing a lot of consternation online well there's a couple things one some people you're either in on Aiden or you're out and he's a very divisive player so that's going to obviously heat the conversation up a lot the way he went from a pillar of a finals team to in consecutive playoffs, getting benched for Bismack Biombo and, and Jock Lawndale. Like that's quite the descent. Um, so he's going to have people that believe in the final, the, the version of him that took that helped take that team to the finals. And then there's going to be people that think he's the version that got benched for, for Biombo and Lawndale the last two years. Mm-hmm. So that's going to obviously make things spicy when you're arguing about this online. The other thing is, um, it's just the the idea of lively being ready and you don't know if he's going to be ready and i think everyone most people agree like hey it would be cool to have a stopgap veteran center so lively doesn't have to start oh, there's no and such you, thing as a 100 million dollar stopgap <laughs> yes i just he, i understand that lively might not be ready while while aiden's contract is here but it's mm-hmm. just to spend 30 plus million dollars a season on a player that you just think is, Hey, we just need someone to sop up these minutes until the real guy we like is ready. Um, you just have to think about resource management. And yeah. I understand that their cap is kind of screwed no matter what. Um, and I also understand that another thing that makes this tricky is that if you're looking at it in a vacuum, Aiden for Tim Hardaway, Jr. Holmes, in home, just that alone, like you look at that on paper and you're like, that's old. <laughs> right. That's Ethan, Ethan in the chat just says that's, Aiden for bench warmers. Yeah. Count, you, know. Uh, you know, even as much as you might like Tim Hardaway Jr., that's just an objective, objectively good swap for the Mavericks in terms of just doing good business. Aiden's 24. He could be awesome uh, in these next three years and playing next to Luca. I'm just, again, it's just tough for me if they, you know, just drafting lively and then getting Aiden. That just, those guys can't play on the floor together. I know some people have talked to me and been like, oh, well, they could, you know, Aiden no. played the four some in college. I'm like, you just have to watch, like, and like Carl Anthony Towns and Gobert play together. And it's like, well, Carl Anthony Towns, you know, shoots 40% on, on five or whatever threes he takes per game. Like none of these lively, maybe he's a shooter, but you cannot project, you cannot make this deal projecting that because that is a shot in the dark that his high school tape somehow, you know, progresses him in there. Well, so it's just it's just tough for me because I do think the path of getting a veteran to start at the beginning of the season makes a lot of sense, and I agree with that. I'm just like, why why does it have to be a 24 year old you know you know no former number one overall pick that costs 30 million dollars a season? Like it just that just doesn't seem smart to me. I just don't I don't understand the logic there in terms of the on the court. I understand the logic for the on paper stuff. 
Just right, like court, if they hadn't have taken it. Lively, had they yeah. taken Cam Whitmore, or if they traded back again and selected a second wing, I would be pounding the table for this one. But right. if you invest this much in Lively, you have to and, – and if you do want a veteran – stopgap a, a mentor a person it's not 24 year old <laughs> call of duty playing i mean frankly like if you watch like like he doesn't like basketball i'm sorry he doesn't he wants to play like dirk and he's not dirk it, it's it's he's not a very good rim protector he's a mountain of a man and i i honestly feel like like if you're super into him then you're approaching this like we see, you know, people, it's like, like people in, in trying to get into a relationship where they're like, I can fix him. I can fix her. Just give me time with all due respect. He would be going from teams where he has played with multiple first round hall of famers, like Chris Paul, Kevin Durant, probably Devin Booker when it's all said and done. And it's, he's just going to come to the Mavericks and Luca's going to fix him. If okay. Like I, I, I really like that from a, like a faith perspective, but I, I, if he can't handle playing with Chris Paul, I don't think he can handle playing with Luca. Luca doesn't have time for this shit. Luca is a competitor. It's the arrested development room meme. Yeah, that's right. It, it might work for us. Now, the flip side of this argument has to be his relationship with Monty Williams deteriorated so badly yeah. that maybe he just needs a fresh start. My counter, my counter counter would be Jason Kidd is going to fix him. Maybe, maybe obviously. Yeah. I mean, I, I still think like, just to be quite candid, I still think this happens. Like just, I, I, my feet, my gut is that something like that doesn't get out on the Maverick side unless they feel some leverage can get there. I have heard from asking around that Frank Vogel really wants a shot with him. And that's why the Suns are being a little bit, uh, pretty, probably, probably pretty resistant. But I just sort of feel like this, this goes over the goal line. And then we find ourselves asking, asking these, these kind of questions. And from a basketball point of view, like so, I saw somebody in the chat say earlier um, that the the Suns may insist on like Reggie Bullock getting into the deal. When you go from a roster standpoint, that would mean the Mavericks have precisely no volume three point shooters. Is there a plan to sign a volume three point shooter? Luka Doncic, you're the one that keeps pounding this point in the table. Luka Doncic mm -hmm. is the single best volume three point shoot shot creator in the league with his drives. Better than Shea, better than LeBron, it's Luka. So if you don't have anybody that's going to be able to take those shots, that's a pretty big hole to fill. Just it, it just is. Now it's it's not to say I, I wouldn't do the deal. I mean, I, I kind of am I'm pretty much at the moment pure 50-50. Like I could be swayed either way. Yeah, it's tough for me because like I said, I understand the you're looking at these guys like a line item. And asset management, like, of course, you'd rather have 24-year-old DeAndre Ayton yep. than 30-year-old Tim Hardaway Jr. and Rashawn Hall. Like, you, yes, even if Bullock's added to the deal. Like, it makes it makes a lot of sense. I'm just trying to figure out how it works on the floor because it there's a lot of talk of, like, well, DeAndre Ayton's an asset and you can flip him later, and it's like, We've seen in this league when when teams treat guys like assets and not players and not humans that that doesn't always right work out. Um, like De DeAndre Aiden, I don't know what his mindset would be coming here, but I don't think he want he would want. Uh, you know, is Derek Lively the future? Like he's gonna want to play. Like he's not like maybe like he, I don't think he's gonna be cool. Like if Derek Lively, like what if there's a scenario in February where like the minute the num the advanced data is showing that the Mavericks are playing better with lively than with Aiden, even if Aiden's doing well. And it's like Aiden's making $30 million a year. That's just not a guy you can be like, all right, well, we're going to bench him or we're just going to trade. It's hard to trade him. Even if he does, even if he does uh, turn his, his career around in Dallas, that's like, yeah, that his was contract makes so understand. much. It's just, it's just, it's going to be tough. Atlanta just gave away John Collins for nothing. Yeah, like, what I, are you going to get for Aiden if he has to be an All Star? If you think you're going to get something good back, and that's a that's a problem. You like that's a bridge you cross when you come to it. But I feel like the like the 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 logic behind well, 
if it doesn't work, you just trade him. Like the Suns can't trade him. Like no, what, what are, the Suns cannot trade him. It, it's all oh, well. You're and if they do trade him, captains, it's for a package that we're saying right now is which is, is a cuckoo you know, platter. And, so. and granted, you know, the, my my friend Dwight of the the Twenty One Going On Seventy Seven podcast makes this point about Chris Stapps Porzingis a lot, where Chris Stapps Porzingis, New Boston Celtic Chris Stapps Porzingis really rebounded his own personal trade value with a really good season. And so looking back on what the Mavericks did at the time with what they got, you might say, ah, well, the Mavericks got screwed on that trade. No, when the Mavericks traded him, he had no value. He had no value. He was on the way back up, but he relative to where he had been, Chris Stapps couldn't move. And so it's like right now, if, if I'm playing devil's advocate to a degree, I'd say, well, DeAndre Ayton is coming off of two really, really subpar uh, performances in the playoffs and has a lot of baggage. And so you're saying, all right, we could, we, we could fix him. We could do it. I don't hate the argument. I just don't find it. I just think it's a lot riskier than, than it's like laid out to be. Cause it's, it's just, when you, when you view it from a 50,000 foot angle, you can trade some guys that you don't love though. I, I, I love the comments in the chat where it's like, Oh, we don't like go look at the Mavericks record when Tim Hardaway jr shot certain percentages like basically he shot 45 percent and they won and then when he didn't shoot 45 percent, the mavericks lost like hardaway was vital to the mavericks that's just a it's just something we're not really giving credit to even though i wish he wasn't so vital i would like to i just think it changes the fundamentals of the mavericks in ways that we're not entirely addressing just because all of us are somewhat tired of the tim hardaway experience which i get so. and, and also i don't want people to be confused that it's like i don't want them to trade tim hardaway it's yeah. just you can make an argument and a certain someone on our website uh, did to uh, that uh, got us all uh, in a lot of trouble. What do you mean? You mean nobody <laughs> liked Xavier's article? This um, is news to me. You, you can make the argument that just even putting the resources into lively um, is, is maybe too rich for a one way center in terms of, uh, you know, not a star. Like you usually don't see, centers in the top 15 selected that aren't um that aren't stars so uh it's well, it's just, like, so, so to add on to that here's a 30 million dollar a year center on top of that that also might not project to be in that all-star tier who's coming off too bad you know i don't know if i want to fix him you know like i understand you need to to do something with your assets that you have but the downside is you don't fix him and you're stuck with a 30 million dollar lemon and yep. like, is that risk worth it for, for what the upside is? And to me, the upside is you trade him for something else. Like, okay. The upside yep. for me is if they're trading T is like, I would rather have a player that helps them. Um, but again, like I said, I'm not married to, to tomorrow junior. Like I'm not saying don't trade tomorrow. Junior. Like if they can find a deal for him, they absolutely, that makes they have to. sense. Like, Tim Hardaway had yeah. no trade value. Like yeah, in the first they 30 were, games. They, so it's they like, that he's in, invested or involved in a trade is pretty interesting. Now that then brings us to, I think like the free agency portion of this and these, these things are related. Okay. Um, we're learning, you know, Scott CBA Mavs wrote a, an explainer about whether the Mavericks would have access to the full MLE. What, what it would mean if they traded for eight and yada, yada, yada. The elephant in the room that I don't think anybody is talking about because no, it just, there's a lot of Mavericks fans that have chosen the Kyrie Irving is going to resign the end. I get it. If Kyrie Irving doesn't make a quick decision enter, entering free agency, the Mavericks options are they're in trouble. Like they're, they're in, they're held hostage by Kyrie. Just <laughs> there's really no other way to phrase it. That's okay. Yeah, that, that deal but, needs to either not get done or get done. Like that needs to be boom, settled. There yeah. needs to be a decision. Friday afternoon, and if they don't have that decision by Friday afternoon, the Mavericks run into problems because they have so much money committed. Now, getting out of from under Bertans helps, but like if you were to trade for Aiton before Friday, and then you, it's just it just ma it makes all this really hard because if if you know the the Aiton element of it all, it's thirty two million on top of Luca's like 40 like his is probably like 46 i can't remember and it's just all of a sudden you're over the cap and you have these very limited things you can do 
And, you know, part of what was really interesting about getting off of Davis Berton's contract is it did open up the Mavericks to the full mid-level exception, um, which is, which I, I felt was important right up until Aiton became available. And as multiple people have noted online, anybody that you can get with the full mid-level exception is probably and very likely not as good as DeAndre Aiton is. And I, it's, a, it's just a good point. Um, but I, I find myself just sort of, a little more concerned that I was right after draft night because the, the Mavericks have to figure out depth. They have to figure out depth. They cannot do what they did last year. And it really feels like they're going to give, you know, another season of Theon, um, Theon, Theo. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and so it's just, they, they have to have real, real uh, players. And I, mm-hmm. I, they it's it's going to be tough it's going to be tough whether you know Kyrie resigns or not whether they trade for Aiton or not if you trade for Aiton and also resign Kyrie depending on how what how much Kyrie were to sign for you basically would have those three guys and then everyone else on a minimum like you would not it, it's it's just it's dangerous it's dangerous so. yeah and it's just for me again I hear the arguments like it's objectively a good talent swap. I'm just, I'm the guy who pounds the table and says center does not need to be the position you invest all your resources in. I've been saying for years, you look at the draft and you look at where these, these role-playing bigs come from. Robert Williams of the Celtics, 27th pick. Rudy Gobert was a 27th pick. Mitchell Robinson was a second round pick. Maxi Kleba was an undrafted free agent. Um, and I understand that there are the Jokic's and the Embiid's, And the car line, like there are exceptions um, to this. There are still superstar centers, but it's, you have to be in that tier. And if you're not in that tier, it drops um, a little bit. So I've just, I've always pounded the table for the way this league is going. You know, teams usually get smaller in the playoffs, not bigger um, when you're talking about lineups. Um, The thing is, is it's trying to play small without actually being small. Like the thing is, you, you is trying to find, the six eight six nine wing that can play four that that allows you to play two bigs, but he's not actually a big. You know, he's a a, a perimeter based wing, but he's still huge. You know, you look at Andrew Wiggins on the Warriors and the Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum's uh, for Boston, and, and and so and so on and so forth for some of these contenders. So it's just hard for me personally to think that investing the twelfth overall pick. And then thirty plus million dollars a year into a position that I think you should be way cheaper on. Like that's just that clashes with how I view team building and stuff. Like yep. That. And I understand that. You know that I'm not saying that's right. I could be wrong. Um, might be nice to have Aiden if they can turn him around and uh, guard Jokic. I don't know. Like I mean, if you can turn him around, he's athletically he's the type of guy that you'd want to do that. So I, I get it. And then also I want to. Um, to break bread and offer an olive branch. I'm totally understanding of the fans that are tired of the 2018, 2019 roster that has last. We have been tired of it. Yeah. That's been our so, stick for hey, two years. If Tim Hardaway Jr. is traded for Aiden, that means in the last couple of years, Dorian's gone. Tim Hardaway Jr. is gone. The last guys are Maxi and uh, Pal. And if you make this trade, Al is probably gone because they're not going to re-sign him. If you if you trade for DeAndre Ayton, I don't see why you would uh, re-sign Dwight Powell. So then it's just I Maxie. heard the Rockets have interest in him, which is yeah. just hysterical to and me. It's like half, half, half. I'm a Dwight Powell guy, but half, right? Um, so again, I, that's appealing to me as just someone as I'm also sick of the roster stagnation. I would love to have a bunch of new guys in here, and if you're trading for Ayton, you're, you're accomplishing that too. So I get part of it is. You know, part of it might be I don't even care how good they are or how it helps. Like it'd just be nice to watch a different roster. Um, there's definitely be very different. That feels that. Yes. I, I mean, it would be very different. I mean, that that comes back to sort of my thought. You know, if if they trade Aiton and let's say they're really insistent on like Reggie Bullock, who wasn't very good for the Mavericks last year and is only partially guaranteed, um, the Mavericks would have to find some specific solutions on the cheap that really panned out. You just, you know, as much as we hate on Hardaway on occasion and on Reggie Bullock, you would have to find shooting. You you know, Kyrie Irving is a dead-eye standstill shooter, but 
you know, and frankly, so's Luca when he actually takes the damn shots. Um, but it's it's that's not going to be your best use of those guys at all times standing in the corner while somebody else goes over. You know, Coops in the chat says, "Oh, this is a real." You know, the, some of the players mentioned this is a really good center rotation. I can't like my my beef with eight. I, I've seen Aiden get cooked alive. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've just seen him. He's become fried chicken, and so it's it's like, like and granted, you know, Jokic, Jokic is going to do that to people. So, but you know, it's like oddly enough, like Dwight Powell caused him a lot of problems. It's uh, so many things. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Josh, you're right about that. Bullock's deal becomes fully guaranteed yeah. at midnight, which is that's you know, it's ten million. They're not going to, yeah, they're yeah. not. They're going to. I don't yeah. think they're going to try to save from the five million yeah. there. But the thing I'm, I also don't understand is. I don't really see the Suns' point of view other than like they're just sick of this guy and they want to get rid of him. But the weird part is the people that were sick of him the most are not with that organization anymore. Like it was Monty Williams and Chris Paul that like really dogged Aiton, right? So he they're gone. And like you said, Frank Vogel has a history of getting the most out of big men. Yeah. What he did in Neanda, look what he did with with Anthony Davis in their title winning season in LA. Um, I, I I totally believe the whispers you're hearing that he would love to uh, try to reclaim him and, and invest into him and, and try to make him a contributor. Because uh, I understand Phoenix has holes on the roster elsewhere, but it's like they really need Tim Hardaway. And, and like, do they really hate Aiton that much that they want to trade him for for guys that I don't even know how much they would play for them? Yeah, it just him? it reads it's so just, weird. Yeah. It re- well, I think they would play for them because they're kind yeah. of in. There's a, built definitely in would. there's a built in level of injury fuckery with that, yeah, with that team. Too. And so Beal like yeah, Beal and Durant aren't going to play. I mean, did you see there was? I'm going to I'm going to let you talk about something. Michael Levin had one of the funniest tweets I've seen about the Spur or about that dang um, uh, about that uh, uh, Phoenix team. I'm going to have to read it to you, but it's just. It, it's really incredible the kind of things that that go on when you're trying to build a team when you don't have options, and it's it's just it's it's wild. Anyway, so you riff your next point. I have to find this because this thing made me laugh so hard. Yeah, I just I've like I said, this is really conflicting for me. I just don't agree with the idea of dumping a lot of valuable resources into the center position, knowing how other teams have gotten them for cheaper. But I also understand you have to play the hand that you're dealt. And if the Mavericks can only invest into that position because that's what's available and they can't spin Tim Hardaway Jr. into a wing that they like that would get rotation minutes or potentially be a starter, I get it. Um, But, yeah, it's tricky. If they did this deal, they would still – I would imagine if they still had access to the MLE, they would still uh, need to find a starter at the four unless you want to throw Prosper in there right away. Like it's Luca, Kyrie, Aiden, and then who are your – if you're trading Tim Hardaway, is it Bullock? And then who's the other guy? Because you can't have Bullock play the four. We just watched the whole season of Bullock trying to play the four. He cannot play the four. You're doing him a disservice. So they would – you know, is it Grant Williams who can – he can play the four? Can you get him for the MLE? I don't know. But uh, we'll see. I, I certainly understand the desire for just new faces and talent. It would be pretty funny – to have DeAndre Ayton on the team with Luca, considering they're in the same draft, they are friends uh, though, and they, they share. They I share the same agent. Share the same agent. Like that's that's mm-hmm. not something to to overlook. I think that's and, a value. And and in the go- budding Suns Mavericks fans rivalry, if Ayton turns into an All Star in Dallas, like Ugh. how funny would that be? Uh, so, yeah. well, and particularly after the fact that that they cooked, you know, they cooked the Mavericks cooked Atlanta to death. Like that's a done deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's just, just and, and, yeah, and sort of, that pick didn't turn into anything that they that's right that's right no. to do anything but i uh, did while looking for this i came across that picture of victor Weminyama with the spurs you know with sean Duncan Elliott, and david and robinson <laughs> is one of the most insane things i've ever seen he is so much bigger than two of the greatest basketball I mean, really, three. I mean, if you include Manu, three of the the greatest basketball players of all time. I just, my God, yeah, he's a he's a freak. Um, and hey, maybe does that does the Wimbenyama being in your division for the next twenty years, maybe does that influence the Mavericks' decision making into hey, we need centers, like we we're going to be playing Victor Wimbenyama four times a year for the next how many years? At least five to ten. 
maybe that factors into it, you know, also. That's and I a can't, really strong point. I, I can't blame them if they're, if they're, t- you know, if he's 80% of what we think he is, he's all like, he's, he's one of the great, he's one of the best NBA players ever. Like, can, yeah, but, and I can't find the stupid thing I was looking for. Cause of course trying I can't. To find? It was a, it was basically like a series of Chris Haynes tweets that where it's like the Suns were bringing in guys where it quickly became like, 2010 like g league talk about some guys where yeah. like dudes you hadn't heard of in like seven or eight years that the Suns were bringing in for workouts just while i'm thinking about the women yama of it all it's so fucking annoying that <laughs> we have had to deal you know jean morant who i believe yep. will come back bigger better brighter after um figuring out how to not use uh, flash weapons on social media uh, i also expect him to develop a jump shot Maybe Zion Williamson will get his his shit in in gear, but that's two you know quasi generational players. Um, then you have Victor Wembanyama, <laughs> and then who else is like in this godforsaken division? Um, you know, now the Sun, the Rockets might have you know they got uh, Dude, man. And if 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 Thompson and Whitmore pan out, can you imagine playing that team four times a year? I mean, it just like it, it, the hits keep coming. And I mean, hits like the, the Mavericks still have the best player in the division and that's all that right. matters. But I know it, it's, it's just, it, it blows my mind. And um, it's funny. Cause it was like that with Dirk, with Duncan and, and then Houston. Much meaner. Great, that's our like, yeah. like, yeah. And, yeah. So, all right. So I just got told uh, from my guy Coops there, he was killing me on this. Um, it was so it's like the Suns will bring in for it's thank you, Coops, for this. Phoenix will host a free agent workout on Wednesday featuring notables Jabari Parker and Stanley Johnson, league sources say. Then the next one was Phoenix will also bring in veteran point guard Chasson Randall for workouts. Who? And then yeah, and then there was even another like it just kept oh, sources, guards, guard Quindary Weatherspoon will be included in the workout as well. I mean, it was like they were pulling dudes off of off of 2K create a player. Um, and when I read the names, like oh yeah, that guy, like st- it's just it's it's my that favorite. was like the uh pandemic uh the 2021 season when every team had, had eight a, guys out in, in health and safety protocols and Mavericks are signing Brandon Knight and Marquise Chris and all these oh, names yeah. that we had talked about. Oh, it's yeah. kind of reminded me of that. Well, this has been fun. Do we have anything else we like need to cover? Like Mav, Mavs Moneyball has more content than I knew what to do with. Um, I mean, help. free agency is Friday, so we'll we'll get some answers to a lot of these questions pretty soon. Mm-hmm. That's about mm-hmm. it. We still have stuff coming. You know, we're probably trying to do two to three posts a day. Stuff will really start to slow down, and then we'll, you know, I'm going to Vegas to cover summer league, which this will be. This is that's going to be the funnest summer league team you will have ever. I've watched covered for ten Mavericks. years of summer, and I might like. I want to say it was Brian from As Moneyball who said he would go, like maybe write about some of the teams of the past. Like I've watched some horrendous rosters, <laughs> yes. and it's like guys where it's like there's one NBA player amongst the whole group, and the because the Mavericks just didn't have picks, um, yeah. and and that's just the way it shakes out sometimes. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll probably like slow down eventually. I'm going to host a show Friday during kind of the openings of the free agency stuff just kind of happens to coincide with that. I think um, I'm not sure what time I'm going to do it. My son is at the the Richardson basketball camp this week. Um, and so I might have to go over there and, you know, watch him do some stuff on Friday, but I'll definitely be hosting a show Friday. Um I don't know. I'm just kind of hanging out. Yeah. Ethan asks, what day does the trade go down for eight? And I, I sort of think it's important to do it before free agency starts, if they're going to do it, but that's just my opinion. Um, I think the one thing though, I don't think the whole, if Holmes is involved. They either do it now or they don't do it till the season starts. Basically. I don't think home, the Holmes trade with prosper can be official official until July 6th, I think is what I heard, which is when contracts can be signed. Cause you know, free agency starts July 1st, but that's not actual. Like that's when you can negotiate contracts can be signed, I believe yep. July 6th. Um, so yeah, yeah. Some, someone in the chats, Jeremy says, uh, it can't happen officially till the six. So, uh, I guess they can, they can agree to the parameters of a trade, but yeah, there, there won't be, my guess is if Aiton is traded, there won't be a Deandre Aiton press conference, uh, until after the sixth. Uh, so, but we'll see. They have, the, they have till then to try to maybe expand it make it a three team, maybe the prosper part of it becomes part of with eight and expand it and do a three team deal. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. 
Oh, that's about all I got. Keep checking out Mavs Moneyball. Um, you know, please subscribe to the show here. Uh, you know, and if, if anybody's going to Vegas for, for Summer League, hit me up. Um, you know, I'm just a dude Mark with will a... will be your friend in Vegas. You will be yeah, your, I'm just your a dude wise with internet. sage. Yeah. It's, You're a Vegas it's, veteran. Well, I mean, it's also just I'm like a dude with internet access. It's always weird to go out there and see um, <laughs> real, like, journalists and stuff. And it's just like... Cause they all go out there to schmooze and I'm out there writing game recaps for, for fucking the third summer league game of the week. And these guys are looking at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, look, this is what I was put on earth to do is write garbage copy about a summer league basketball team. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us for close to an hour. Thanks so much for all the support this week. Uh, please hit me up. And also just one more thing before we go. I always forget to do this. We have an email podmaverickpodcast at gmail.com. If you have questions that you would like me to address, I, I will start off the live show probably addressing some of these. So if you could shoot me an email address with what you want to cover podmaverickpodcast at gmail.com. That would be great. Uh, this has been Kirk Henderson and Josh Bow of Pod Maverick After Dark. We will talk with you guys probably next week at this time. Have a great rest of your week.